So our next speaker is Robert Doherty Bliss from Rutgers, who talks about approximations. So please. Uh, thank you, Mel, for the introduction. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak here at the seminar. I have to admit that if you just listen to James' excellent talk and some of the talks from earlier today and yesterday, this is going to seem like a very different flavor, probably. But uh, with the 100 speakers, I guess some surprises are bound to get through the net. So hope you enjoy a little bit of variety on this lovely Tuesday. So uh, this is a collaboration that I did with Christoph Kuchan and Daron Zeilberger on approximations of constants. And I wanted to start off with a brief little history lesson of constants that we know a little bit about. And uh, specifically, I want to take a, a view on these constants uh, from the irrationality perspective. So there are a few famous constants that we know to be irrational. The first one is square root of two or square root of three, square root of five, square root of any prime really. It is entirely trivial to prove that this is irrational. We've known this for thousands of years, right? I, I'd wager that everyone here has probably taught their grandmother how to prove this over like Thanksgiving dinner or something like that here in the US. You just start off by assuming that square root of two is rational and you can write down some immediate contradiction about two steps later. The next big constant up would be uh, Euler's constant, E. And this is not as easy, admittedly, but it is still fairly straightforward. You just look at the sequence of partial sums and you get this very nice uh, approximation that a few steps later will lead to a contradiction by constructing some impossible integer. The most famous irrational constant is probably pi though. And this is just not easy at all, in fact. Uh, the first proof came, I think, in the mid 1700s and it involves some continued fraction expansion. And these days, the simplest proof that I know off the top of my head involves a sequence of kind of unusual looking definite integrals. And as far as constants go, that's ab about it actually, which is sort of surprising. Uh, any constant besides these three or like minor variations, like sums of them products in, in nice cases is almost impossible to say anything about, which is, very ironic given that we know that essentially every constant is irrational unless there's a good reason for it. But it turns out that our methods are pretty powerless to actually say anything about specific constants at any point. And one great example of this is the first odd zeta value. So this is the Riemann zeta function, which is the sum of reciprocals of powers of integers. Zeta of three is the sum of reciprocals of cubes of the natural numbers. Uh, the first person to look at this and conclude that it was irrational was Roger Opery back in 1978, sort of a surprising proof to say the least. And what's especially surprising about it is that it's so difficult compared to Zeta of two. So Zeta of two is actually very straightforward. A long, long time ago, back in the 1500s, I think, Euler, showed that zeta of two is some rational multiple of pi squared. And since we know that pi is transcendental, that's easy, we're done. But zeta of three, as far as anyone can tell, has no nice expression in terms of other constants at all. You just kind of have to take it at face value. So Opery's proof sort of came out of left field. Uh, it used some very surprising techniques. And I'd like to give a, a brief little account of how it went. So how Opery starts things off, there are a lot of details, but if you sort of ignore all of them and look just, you know, don't miss the forest for the trees, so to speak, he starts off with this recurrence right here. This is a second order recurrence with polynomial coefficients. Uh, capital N here is the shift operator. So you take a, a sequence n, a sequence u, say, and when you multiply on the left by it, you just shift n forward by one. So this uh, n squared here means this is a second order recurrence. So you look at this recurrence and you pick out two solutions to the recurrence, kind of arbitrarily. There's motivations for it, but you just pick out two of them. The first one is A of N, which starts off with initial conditions zero and six. The second one is B of N, which starts off with initial conditions one and five. Then 
Opry makes two assertions about these sequences. The first assertion, which is already sort of surprising, is that B of n is actually an integer for every n. And the reason that this is surprising is because to get the next term using this recurrence, you have to divide by the cube of an integer at some point. So somehow there is enough cancellation, that doesn't matter. The next surprising assertion is that A of n is a rational, so it has a denominator that isn't one, is what I mean by that, but we have some control on the denominator. It's actually divisible by essentially the least common multiple of one up to n cubed, which also seems kind of unusual to derive from this recurrence, but this was Opry's assertion. The next assertion is that in fact, a of n over b of n converges to zeta of three. It is a rational approximation of zeta of three. Not only is it an approximation, it's a very good approximation. It's in fact too good of an approximation. It converges so quickly that it implies that zeta of three is irrational. And that has a, a technical meaning. And let me, let me explain what that is right here. So when I say that it converges too quickly, there is this sort of well-known theorem uh, criterion for showing that something is irrational. If you can find integers a n and b n, where the difference between a n over b n and some constant is not too big compared to the denominator, the size of b n in this sense here. So a n over b n minus c is on the order of one over b n to the one plus delta, where delta is some positive constant, that actually implies that this constant C you're looking at is irrational. So this is exactly how Opry did things. And when you go through his proof, you can actually write down an explicit delta. There's a, like an exact formula you can write down and it gives you this delta of 0 0.080529 and so on and so forth. The exact expression involves some logarithms and some roots of quadratics, but all that matters is that it's positive. And that is actually kind of the, that's the entire story right there behind the proof. Everything else are some details to check. Um, it is important to note that this theorem right here requires that you started off with integers and we didn't actually. Uh, a priori only, these are rational numbers. So you have to make sure you clear out the denominators. But uh, one of Opry's assertions is that we have a good understanding of how the denominators work. So all you have to do is go back and check that that doesn't ruin the convergence speed once you clear those things out. And it doesn't, it turns out. And despite the fact that you can explain the main idea of this proof in one and a half slides, more or less, it is still sort of magical. And all the details to be checked are not easy. I mean, it takes a, a considerable amount of effort to actually go back and check all this stuff. But even coming up with this recurrence right here, Opry kind of just pulls it out of thin air. It's like magic, where does it come from? And the question is, why does it work on zeta of three? Are there different ways that you could maybe look around and find different recurrences that would work on other constants that we would love to know more about? Why is zeta of three special? Can we get maybe other zetas like zeta of five, zeta of seven, things like that? Who, who knows what could come out? So Opry was not very willing to talk much about how he came up with this. It's sort of at a loss to explain, but other people spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, and in fact, a few years after Opry gave his proof, someone else, uh, Fritz Boykers, came up with another way to prove that zeta of three using a very similar idea, in fact but starting from a very different place. So look at this sequence of definite triple integrals right here. It, it seems almost as arbitrary as the recurrence that we started off with before, but there is actually a little bit of motivation behind it that Boykers talked about in terms of orthogonal polynomials and things like that. But um, what really matters is that it turns out this sequence of definite integrals satisfies the same recurrence that Opery gave. And in fact, you don't even need to be a genius to figure this out. We have really good algorithms these days for automatically finding these kinds of recurrences, uh, algorithms that work on so-called holonomic functions, but that's sort of beside the point for now. 
what matters is that we can automatically go from this sequence of integrals to a recurrence uh, and rediscover what Opry did. And in fact, if you look at the initial values for this sequence of integrals, it turns out you just have to be able to evaluate it when n is zero and n is one, that this sequence of integrals is actually a rational combination of zeta of three and one, I suppose, is what you would say. So this right here, i of n is you know, some rational plus zeta of three times some other rational is what I mean by that. And in fact, the, the rationals a n and b n satisfy the same recurrence. And that's not so hard to see once you sit down and think about it for a second. What is great about this method is that this integrand right here, because we're integrating over the unit cube in three dimensions, is actually bounded from above by some constant. And that's, that's just a calculus exercise to work out what the constant is. And the idea is that means that then this integral decreases to zero exponentially quickly, which is very nice because that means that this rational expression here, this combination of a n plus zeta three b n also goes to zero very quickly. And that basically means that a n divided by b of n is a really good rational approximation to zeta of three. And in fact, if you go through the details, this is what Fritz Boyker did back in the uh, 80s, I think, is this converges so fast, it again proves that zeta of three is irrational. So this gives us a way to redo the operi proof, but with considerably less hand-waving magic. Like this, this recurrence doesn't just come out of nowhere. Now we have some idea for how to come up with it. And in fact, it even gives us a little bit of inspiration for how we can tweak things a little bit. So what we could do is take a look at the sequence of definite integrals and introduce some kind of parameters into it. Find some way to change it slightly to see if maybe we get new recurrences out that might let us look at different constants. And so let's look at how we might do that. So instead of looking at a, a triple integral, let's just start off looking at a double integral because it's a little bit computationally simpler. So this is uh, more or less like the exact triple integral we were looking at, we just eliminated the w variable. So now it's uh, it's a little bit easier to, to swallow. It's also now symmetric in the two variables, which is nice. Well, not for all parameters, I guess. But what we do is we take these, we fix uh, four rationals. And we, instead of raising everything to the nth power, we just introduce some shifts here like this. So we just subtract the rationals from uh, from n. And this is well-defined most of the time. You could run into some issues with convergence occasionally, but for all the values of the parameters we're going to talk about, everything still works out just fine. And in fact, this double integral is not so hard to tackle. If you wanted to do, say, the full triple integral where you add parameters here, it becomes very hard to tackle naively, and you have to go use some very fancy uh, packages, some nice software packages. And that's where our collaborator, uh, Christoph Kuchan, came in and helped us evaluate uh, some nice recurrences for the triple integral. But we won't talk about that today because it's a little, a little messy. The upshot for this is that even with arbitrary parameters, this sequence of integrals still satisfies a nice second order recurrence with polynomial coefficients. It is not always the same as the opri recurrence. It, it's not even related always in some way. There's, there's almost always something fundamentally different going on. But that doesn't matter. It still usually implies then that the sequence of integrals is, again, a rational combination of one and some constant. And in fact, the constant here is dependent on the parameters. It's the first term in the integral sequence. And you might wonder, what kind of constants can we get out? Well, it's actually not so hard if you go through and just plug in n equals 0 and then do some geometric series expansion. You can see that this is actually just a special value of some hypergeometric function. So this sequence of definite integrals, it turns out, by looking at some recurrences, will give us rational 
combinations of special values of the hypergeometric function. And this is interesting because hypergeometric functions can spit out lots of interesting constants. In fact, if you set all the parameters equal to zero, you'll get zeta of two back out. And that will give us a way to redo the proof that zeta of two is irrational, even though we already knew that. And this was something that even Boykers did. He redid the proof that zeta of two is irrational as well as zeta of three. So our goal in life at this point, given this uh, big search space of parameters, is to try and find a nice sets of parameters where our, uh, our approximation alpha of n over beta of n converges really quickly. And by that, I mean converges where we get a delta greater than zero, which would tell us that we have some potentially new constant that is irrational. And we can do this searching pretty quickly because we can go from the parameters to the recurrence relation almost instantly. It takes no time at all. And once we have the recurrence relation, uh, our approximations, alpha and beta, they both satisfy the same recurrence. So it's easy to churn out thousands and thousands of terms of those, as many as you care to look at after a while. So it's easy to check what constant we're looking at and to compute these. And once we have enough terms in hand, it's also easy to figure out what the delta should be, or at least a nice approximation for it. So all you do is take a look at this equation right here, which is like a way to estimate empirically what it should be, ignoring some constant factors that might be involved. And this equation is easy to solve for delta exactly. You just take some logs, move some things around. So this gives us something that we'll call an empirical delta. It's not rigorous, but the details to make it rigorous should not be too hard to fill in, is the thinking. So you do this search over a bunch of rationals, and you look and see what constants fall out. Are they interesting? And you look and see which ones have positive deltas. And if you see deltas that are really positive, hey, maybe you have some kind of new proof that something is irrational. And if you're lucky, maybe no one has a proof that it's irrational and you get to write a very nice paper about it. Here is a, a sample, a brief table of just five of the parameters that we have. Uh, we have a database of hundreds and hundreds of constants and with positive deltas, but who wants to look at more than five at a time really? So the first one, when you take all the parameters to be zero, the constant that you get out is just zeta of two. And this gives you this delta right here, which I think is exactly the delta that you get when you do Aperi's proof for zeta of two as well. I think it recovers that uh, approximately, of course. It's not exactly the same. Uh, for the next sequence of parameters, you get one over two times the square root of three, which, you know, who cares, right? That's already irrational. Um, the next one, though, you see it starts to get a little more complicated. You get pi over the square root of three, which, okay, fair enough. It is irrational, but it is not as simple as one over two times the square root of three. But the constants pretty quickly become weirder and weirder as time goes on. So as the parameters get more complicated, as the denominators get bigger, these hypergeometric functions get stranger and stranger. And here we've got this, you know, square root of pi times gamma four thirds over gamma five over six. And this starts to be very unusual. At this point, unless you were an expert on gamma values, you're one of the people who thinks about irrationality, you, you probably can't at a glance tell me this is irrational or it's irrational. Um, of course, if you are an expert, you could at a glance probably tell me it's irrational or not. But uh, I think for the layman, the, the, the mathematician on the street, these things look sort of strange. So even though some of these constants that we get out of this computer search are actually relatively straightforward to see they're irrational, you know, like this is essentially square root of three, this is essentially pi times square root of three, you know, zeta of two, again, that's basically pi squared. Some of these are easy, but other ones are not. And some constants, I mean, they have a hypergeometric evaluation, but it doesn't look like they have any nice closed form, or maybe they, there would be a way to guess what the closed form is. But like this sequence of parameters, we weren't able to find anything involving gammas and square root of pi. But maybe someone out there knows a better way to guess what these constants might be. So the ones that we don't really know anything about, finding these sufficiently positive deltas, you know, these are pretty big as far as deltas go, 
this is interesting because it tells us that maybe there are these new constants that come from hypergeometric functions that, hey, here's a proof that it's irrational. All you have to do is fill in the details. And even if we already know these constants are irrational, if you can find something that has a bigger delta than anything we've ever seen before, that is also interesting. It's kind of a game, it turns out, to try and find bigger and bigger deltas. So any delta positive proves irrationality, but if you can find the biggest delta that we know, then that's also interesting and that's worth saying something about. So rather than trying to rack your brain so much, why not try a computer search to see if you could find some interesting deltas here that maybe we, you would have had to look very hard for by hand. But in any event, all of this is still roughly empirical. There are some, some details to be filled in. And what are those details exactly? So they're not too difficult to say what they are, but actually checking them would probably take some effort. We don't think it would take that much thought exactly. You know, an expert sufficiently motivated could probably figure it out in short order, but it's not trivial to look at and just say, oh, this is what you do. The, the problem with all of these empirical proofs is that alpha of n and beta of n, the uh, numerator and denominator of your approximation, they need to be integers. And the recurrences that you generate only tell you that they're rational. So you need to replace them somehow. You need to normalize them, multiply them by some factor that clears their denominators. And the only way to do that, to make sure that you don't mess up convergence, is you multiply them both by the same thing. So the best thing that you could multiply them by is the least common multiple of their denominators. That'll just clear their denominators right away, and it's the smallest thing you could multiply by. The issue with this is that you make the denominators bigger when you do this. Not the denominators of beta of n. I mean, you clear the denominators, you set them to one, but the denominator sequence, beta prime of n, this now gets bigger. And so the convergence relative to the denominators might be different. So you need to go back and check the deltas to make sure that nothing was modified too much. And there are some ways to do that, but we haven't found a way to automate it yet. So all of the deltas that I mentioned in that table up above and all the ones in our database are actually, they take this into account. So it looks like even when you normalize, then it's pretty straightforward to go back and prove the delta is positive, but it requires checking and the details are not always entirely obvious. So just to wrap up here, uh, I think that irrationality proofs are very difficult. I, I mean, there are some very easy to write down constants that we have no idea if they're irrational or not. Um, like Euler's other constant, gamma, or the Catalan constant. I mean, lots of things that it would be great to know, but we really have no idea. And it's hard to find these proofs. So maybe an interesting approach would be rather than racking our brains looking at specific constants, why don't we flip it around and look at approaches that are promising and see if interesting constants fall out of those approaches? Because at the end of the day, that sort of feels like what Opry and Boykers did anyway back in the 70s and 80s. So maybe we'll get lucky, just like Opry and Boykers did, and stumble upon some really well-known constant. And even if we don't, maybe we'll stumble upon some constant that we could pretend is well-known and write a paper about it. And if we're particularly lucky, uh, I think we could possibly find ways to even automate some of the rigorous parts of the proof where you need to check the rate of convergence. But that does seem to be a bit harder, but maybe with a little bit more thought, we could even help out the experts a little bit more in that way and hand them really a small, you know, a, a rationality theorem on a silver platter with one little tiny lemma left over for them to check. And maybe that would be more appealing for people. But uh, that's all I have to say today. So thanks everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, any questions for our speaker? Uh,
I'm not sure, by the way, that I would say that either Appery or Boykers was lucky. Uh, that is probably correct, actually. <laughs> uh, luck is when, what is it, opportunity and hard work meet or something like that? Wow. Um, I have to confess, I was, are... actually, I was actually present when Appery gave his original talk in Marseille in 1778, I think it was. Is that so? Yes, and nobody in the audience understood a word that he was saying. Is that and just the French, and the French? French? The French just booed him and, and cheered and jeered. Uh, but Hendrik Lenstra was there and he had a, an early pocket calculator, an HP 65, I think, programmable. So he programmed um, these numbers that were coming out of Apri's proof and calculated them to nine decimal places. And they agreed. And after that, people started to believe that there was something in it. <laughs> but wasn't, I mean, my. Wasn't Appery uh, also a uh, well-known, very right-wing political guy in France? Yeah, I think so. so. A lot of the mathematicians, you know, would have jeered him just for his politics. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's an incredible story, though. Thanks for sharing. Any other comments or questions? Uh, can I be heard? I can hear someone. Yes. That's it's. This is Russell Hundell, the next speaker. Uh, Robert, I just wanted to mention there is someone, he developed special software, his name momentarily evades me, but I can give it to you and he's a brilliant programmer and you give him any constant and he will tell you how it's a product of things. So I'll, I'll find his name and his website. Um, uh, I, I think he's an editor of the MAA now and he'd probably be able to help you identify some of these constants. He might even be able to give you some programming help. But th that would be a very good uh, combination, the two of you together. Oh, that would be wonderful. I'd appreciate that. Right. Uh, I always forget names momentarily. I, th I think the algorithm is PCLS. And the way it works is um, you calculate things. And if it's equal to an integer within 20 decimal places, that means you found the pattern. And, and, and he, he gave us a demonstration once, the weirdest things in the world, and he could easily identify them as gamma this times pi and anything else in the world. Hmm, okay. And he's a very good programmer. So uh, he's, um, I think the two of you would have, you'd, you, you'd be able to produce a lot together. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I would appreciate that. Okay, Robert, thank you again. Russell, well, you. do you want to share screen with your